Years and years ago, uh, Regina and I, with uh, four friends, decided to uh, rent a sailboat for a week off the coast of Maine. And about midway through our trip, we decided to head to a place called Matinicus Island, which, is, which has a very small harbor within which we could anchor for the evening, protected from the ocean. Now, Matinicus, which means far out, is in a language I can't pronounce, but it's an, it's an island about 20 miles off of Maine's coast. The island has about 70 residents, no tourist facilities, and is home to rugged lobstermen and fishermen. What just so happens when we were anchored in that small harbor that a lobster boat puttered by heading to port, and we waved the fellow down and asked if we could purchase some lobsters from him, and he said, sure. And then after we bought them, he said, you know, for a small fee, if you come ashore, my wife would be happy to, to cook those lobsters for you, knowing we had no way to do it on the sailboat. We thought it was a great idea. And so we took the sailboat's dinghy to shore and tied it to the end of a well-worn dock. We then walked to the lobsterman's house to have the lobsters cooked. And after we ate our lobsters and spent time talking with the locals, when it was time to leave, we headed back down to the dock. And to our amazement, the dinghy was sitting on the ground at the end of the dock. <laughs> you see, the water line had moved dozens of yards down shore. We'd forgotten about the main tides in the area, which are 11 to 15 feet, which means what is covered by water at one moment may very well be dry land just a few moments later. So we had to carry the six of us, the dinghy, down the sand to the water's edge, and we got it in the water, and I said to everyone, I'll captain the dinghy back to our boat. I was only capable of captaining a, captaining a dinghy, not a sailboat, I thought. So we all got in the dinghy, and I started the engine, and then I gunned it. And maybe, maybe three seconds later, we were nearly all thrown out of the dinghy into the 48-degree water because the dinghy suddenly and violently stopped. Then, brilliant Robert realized something. I had failed to untie the dinghy <laughs> from the dock. <laughs> Clearly, I had forgotten something very important. Always untie a dinghy from a dock. Now, when it comes to dinghies, and dinghies like me, and dinghies and sailing, there are some very basic things to keep in mind, some of which I clearly forgot. Things that make or break a journey, let alone your neck. But as I reflect upon that time on Matinicus Island, it strikes me that when it comes to another journey, in fact, a far more important journey than sailing or riding at a dinghy, that there are some important things to keep in mind as well. And that other journey is our journey following Jesus. And when we pay attention to Jesus' words in the Gospels over and over and over again, Jesus offers us tidbits worth remembering, if you will, day in and day out. And our reading in Luke from today is no exception. Living out our faith, as we know, is challenging, especially because so much of what we hear today actually runs counter to Jesus' guidance. It's vital to remember that whenever we read or hear Jesus' words in Scripture, they are never meant to tear us down, to induce depleting guilt, thoughts of deficiency, or make us feel less than. Rather, whenever Jesus speaks to his followers, including to you and to me, his words are meant to be words that guide us with love to lead us into a fuller and deeper relationship with him. With that in mind, Jesus has a lot to say to us today. And as we get into the reading, my hope is that for each of us, some of the points that Jesus makes will hit home to each of us. It's my prayer that some of what Jesus says will help each of us on our journey in faith. And so let's get into our reading. In chapter 9 of Luke, Jesus is quite busy. It's right after some big events. He had just fed 5,000 people plus, and now his, he and his companions are hanging out. And as Jesus and his companions spend time together, Jesus offers, a, over a series of days, he offers his followers some rapid-fire guidance, guidance worth paying attention to. Again, tidbits worth remembering. Well, Jesus begins by saying, hey, listen up, you've heard the phrase, son of man, well, that's another name for me. 
and pay attention to this. The Son of Man will soon be betrayed and people are going to do some brutal things. Luke tells us that Jesus' followers did not understand what Jesus was saying. Luke says the folks, in fact, were so perplexed by what Jesus said that Jesus might as well have been speaking some language no one had ever heard before. Luke says even no one could make heads nor tails out of what Jesus was saying. And then we learn something very important. Jesus says not only did his followers not understand what Jesus was saying, but they were too embarrassed to ask Jesus what on earth he meant. They didn't understand Jesus, and they were too afraid to ask. I know in my own journey of life, more often than not, I don't understand. And it's not that I'm necessarily embarrassed to ask, it's sometimes I don't even know what to ask. But as I'm thinking about this story and not understanding and not asking, as I think about it, from where I sit, I think it's very clear in Scripture and in our journey that not understanding a lot of things and having a lot of questions is actually what it means to be a person of faith. In fact, throughout Scripture, God makes it very clear that having a lot of questions and not understanding things, in fact, is the norm. I find, for example, God's words to a fellow named Job quite apropos. God one day said to Job in excerpts, Where were you when I created the earth? Who decided on its side? Have you ever gotten to the bottom of things? And here I believe God is not so much chastising Job, but rather letting Job know that the norm for being a human being and a person of faith is not only not knowing everything, but when it's all said and done, not knowing a lot. So I believe that part of our Christian walk is to learn to be comfortable with not knowing a lot. Because I believe that our Christian walk is ultimately not about being certain about or knowing about a lot of things. Rather, it is far more about trusting the one we are following in the midst of not knowing and in the midst of all of our questions. Perhaps, Jesus high, perhaps Luke highlights Jesus' encounter with his followers in our story to remind us of this. I know in my own journey in faith, I have become less and less certain about a lot of things and more and more confident about just a few. I'm confident that Jesus is God, that Jesus died on the cross that brings about forgiveness in ways that are quite mysterious to me. I'm confident that Jesus rose from the dead and that we not need fear death because something amazing follows for each of us. And I'm absolutely confident that when it's all said and done, despite all the language and all the words and all the stuff that goes on in churches today, that the only thing that matters is love when it's all said and done. But as far as the rest, all of the things that so many people fight over, I'm leaving to God knowing that God embraces me even when I throw a lot of unanswerable questions his way and when I admit that I don't know a lot. Because again, I believe our journey is more about trust than knowledge. In some ways, in this part of our reading today, I think Jesus is saying to each of us, you know, you don't know everything. Get comfortable with that. You're not supposed to. There's no way you can and it's okay. Ask any questions you have, but in the midst of all that, spend your energy trusting me instead. Personally, I find this to be a relief because my brain is not big enough to understand most things. But right after this, Jesus' followers start arguing about which of them is going to be the most famous. Their timing is pretty striking, isn't it? They start talking about who's going to be the greatest of them all after Jesus talks about being betrayed. And in response to their squabbling, Jesus immediately starts talking about children. He says, you know, when you welcome a child in my name, you welcome me. And when you welcome me, you welcome God. Now, we know children are playful, joyful, trusting, curious, open to new experiences, love to engage their five senses. But these are not the aspects of children that Jesus was getting at here. You see, in Jesus' day, children had zero social standing, very few, if any, rights, and were not viewed as we view children today. In those days, children had zero status without any legal protection. They, were, in fact, were at the very bottom 
of the pecking order. Now, Jesus points to children because they, especially then, were utterly powerless and completely dependent upon the people around them. And here, Jesus responds to his followers' debate about who will be the most famous by saying, greatness is not the point, guys. Neither is status. Status really matters zero. Ultimately, humility, not power, dependence, not independence, is the path to follow Jesus. And he used the low status of children to make this point. It's a great reminder for all of us that self-aggrandizement and ego impede, constrain, and limit our ability to follow Jesus with any seriousness. Our egos can decrease our dependence on God, and our egos certainly make it less likely we will do what God would have us do in situations. Our egos get us off track in our faith journey. This reminds me, as many of you know, I uh, remain an Episcopal uh, minister, and years ago I was part of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire, and my bishop at the time was an amazing man. He's now long gone, and I miss him. He was a tremendous mentor. But as you know, bishops in the Episcopal Church, when they gather, they like to wear long robes and carry big sticks and wear tall hats. It signifies their role and their status. The same, of course, is true with bishops in many other denominations. But one day my bishop, instead of wearing his bishop hat to a bishop meeting, wore a cone head. (laughs) Like a a cone head from the movie The Coneheads. He wasn't trying to ridicule his fellow bishops or their role. He was not trying to ridicule their faith or their leadership. Rather, he was trying to remind them in a memorable, humorous way never to take themselves too seriously, never to be concerned with their status or how wonderful or great they were, but rather to take Jesus seriously. And his point was to remind us all that while we need to take God seriously, we really should never take ourselves, our status, our roles, or how great we are, seriously. I try and remember and think of my dear bishop and his cone head any time thoughts of wanting status or being important cross my mind. But let's get back to Luke. The two things that happen next in our reading are quite potent with much relevance in our day. In the story, Jesus' close follower, John, says, Hey, Jesus, I heard about this guy who was confronting bad spirits using your name. But the guy's not part of our group. He's not one of us. He's one of them. So when we heard about it, we told him to knock it off. And then immediately, sometime later, Jesus made it clear he was headed to Jerusalem, and he asked his followers to go into a Samaritan village to ask people for some help and hospitality when they travel through the town. Now, the Samaritans who did not like Jews, just as Jews did not much care for Samaritans, refused to be helpful. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus. So Jesus' followers went to Jesus and told him what happened. They said, hey, Jesus, they won't help us. We need to call some lightning down from the sky and take them out. Just zap them and teach those people a lesson. Well, Luke put these two stories together, I believe, for a reason. They both have to do with who is in and who is out. And Jesus will have none of it. In the first part, a guy who is not part of the in group is told to stop it because what he is doing, he is doing, but he's not part of one of us after all. And then in the second part of the story, Jesus' followers are treated like outsiders themselves by the Samaritans, and they don't like it at all, despite the fact that they themselves act the same way toward others. And so they're ticked off. And Jesus isn't happy with any of it. This is a poignantly applicable story to us today in our own faith journey. I know many in Protestant mainline churches that will say other mainline Protestant churches are okay, but it's Catholics. I know many in conservative evangelical churches that 
think other evangelical churches are okay, but Snowmass Chapel? Wow. Not sure they really get it. They're too welcoming to too many people. Especially about social issues. They're leading people astray. In groups and out groups. Certain Christians are faithful, other Christians are not. Certain Christians understand God, others do not. Certain Christians value Scripture, but he doesn't because of what he believes about that one particular thing. Certain Christians have views that are valid, others do not. Certain Christians are doing Christ's work, others are not, or absolutely should not. In groups and out groups, Christianity is infected with this way of thinking. And Jesus' followers in Luke's gospel were attempting to create lines of division, not only spiritually, but culturally. Remember, they went after the Samaritans. And Jesus' response is clear, stop it. And sadly, we are in an era, aside from just religious domains, in which people with whom we differ are never, ever, 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 under any circumstance to be listened to, paid attention to, nor should we attempt to understand their perspective. We sometimes think of an opinion or group's identity as not in alignment with our own, that everything about what they think or write or say or speak is off base and bad. And I believe in our journeys of faith, if we adopt such black and white, in and out, us and them ways of thinking, we lose sight of the lessons to be learned in the midst of differences. And ultimately, we erode our relationship with God who is the God of all, even those who are in an in-group we would never want to be part of. Finally, in our reading today, we encounter three short snippets of three people who want to follow Jesus. And across the three people, Jesus makes really the same point. Whether by saying to a fellow that he should not count on staying in great places, or by another responding to another, skip your dad's funeral, or by proclaiming to someone else there's no time to attend to your personal schedule, Jesus is clear. Following him at times is uncomfortable, inconvenient, and hard. Uncomfortable, inconvenient, and hard. And in these verses, it's perhaps obvious yet important to be clear that Jesus is not saying don't attend to obligations or skip a funeral or that schedules and responsibilities should be blown off. But what he is getting at is that the more we take our faith seriously, the more our faith is going to cost us something. And it's going to cost us in a variety of ways. For example, when we're committed to our journey with Christ, the more often we will be compelled to act, think, and feel differently about things that may put us at odds with who and what is around us. For example, Following Christ means revenge, hostility, and retribution are not part of our lives. Gossip, tearing others down, and sitting in judgment of other people is not part of who we are. Greed is not part of who we are. Seeking security in the material world is not part of who we are. It means not yielding to thoughts that will lead us astray from commitments we have made. It means being committed to prayer and worship and engagement in a community of faith. It means that when we look at our checkbook or our visa statement, there'll be a clear line between that line and the love of God. It means we really need to give up being a jerk in response to the one who could care less. It means putting love first. It means a lot of things for each of us, but I believe we're each compelled to ask with some frequency in our journey, what is my walk with Jesus costing me? Nothing, a lot. Our answers can shape, transform, and even change the path we're taking. But as I think about it, cost is not the end game, is it? Rather, a transformed life, a life of joy and service and love and relief and healing and purpose and a life filled with grace and adventure is what comes from following Jesus far more than cost. And so I realize I've covered a lot today just in these little snippets of teachings from Jesus, little tidbits for the journey. But just to sum up and review some things for us to think about, knowledge is not what our faith is ultimately about. Trust is. Following is. Certainty about too many things 
is not what our faith is all about. Being willing to be a person who asks questions in all kinds of settings, even if they seem unanswerable or trite or embarrassing, is part of what our journey is about. Embracing the truth, again, that our walk with Jesus is about trust more than getting it. Working on letting go of our egos and the need for status and recognition. Avoiding in-group and out-group versus us and them thinking instead of seeking, listening, and understanding of various perspectives is part of our journey. And accepting that the more committed we are to our faith, the more it's going to cost us but cost us in ways that result in a life that is so much better. Again, a lot to keep in mind, and my prayer for each of us is that whether it has to do with the point about knowledge or certainty or having questions or trust or our egos or our status or us versus them thinking or cost, I hope there's a rub somewhere for each of us in something there. And if there is, I pray that we each will spend some time quietly with God exploring what that little pressure point is all about. For in doing so, we will be more faithful on our journey. Just some tidbits today for our walk with Jesus. And do remember, by the way, that if you ever are in a dinghy, make sure the darn thing's untied (laughs) before you leave the dock. And let us pray.